and I always like, give me, give me height <laughs> and give me skin complexion and then I can do something for you. But I need those, those two details to start the lighting process. This is a Cinity Gear News video. Welcome everybody to this CineD interview. Today on my call here is Joshua Z. Weinstein. He's in LA right now. How are you? You know, uh, living the COVID dreams. Living the COVID, like all of us, right? It's just insane. You know, you, it's hard to put your head around. You know, thanks for taking the time. The reason why we got in touch is because you are behind the new Marvel documentary Behind the Mask. And I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. But yeah, just before the call, actually, you mentioned that you, you knew our site for quite a while. So um, how, how did you get started? And, and, you know, like with the whole DSLR revolution, I guess you were start, getting started at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I remember because when I went, I started Super 16 in college. And then during college, the DVX 100 came out, which was that... Um, you know, the first 24p DV camera, and that was a game changer. I mean, I don't know if you remember this movie called Iraq and Fragments. It was a, it was a documentary by James Longley that, that came out uh, in 2006. Or, um, and it just blew your mind that he could do such an incredible film with a DV camera. And that changed my life, that camera. That, that camera, like, I was out there shooting films right away as soon as I got that camera. And, just, and it taught me everything, that camera. Yeah, I think people forget that there was a DV revolution before there was a DSLR revolution. And now I don't know what's coming next, probably a smartphone revolution or something uh, when everybody's just shooting on their phones now. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah, oh my, I know. The phone, I did a project where I had to down res my cell phone footage outside so that it would look worse than my Alexa footage actually. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, but when you started Cinema 5D and you said it was 08 or 07, because I, I, um... I started end of 2008, beginning of 2009. Did you, because the 5D, it was so hard, <laughs> you know, you had to get like a little eye finder to go behind the camera, the focus. Did, did you know as soon as you got the 5D that this was going to change everything or do you think it was just a fun toy at that point? You know, the only good thing about it was that you were able to use a large sensor and shoot video with it. But that was it. I mean, you let you had aliasing, you had, as you said, you couldn't really focus. It was really, it said 1080p, but it wasn't really 1080p in terms of resolution. It was a really soft image. Wow. Um, so one of my close collaborators is, is this photographer named Yoni Brook. And him with Vincent Leferetti did the first ever 5D film together in, in like shooting through a helicopter and everything. Um, and Yoni got a co-director credit on that. But it was just amazing that like just to witness that whole change. Now I feel like an old man, which I guess I, I'm getting. I'm getting there. Um, yeah, Vincent, I mean, Vincent really uh, also launched his career with, with this film, I mean, Reverie, and uh, uh, we worked together later on. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like it changed so many things for so many people. What, what year was the FS100? Because that was the first camera I invested in because I liked that it had XLRs, though. But that, that was quickly after, I mean, it was in the last couple of years after the 5D came out. Yeah, the, you mean the, so, what was it called? FS100, I think, the Sony. Yeah, yeah, the Sony. It was kind of like... It was like 4K that camera or something, but like interchangeable lenses. I'm actually using, I bought all, a whole set of Nikkor AIS lenses, you know, just because they were so cheap back then. And I'm, I'm using one right now on a 24 millimeter on, on this camera right now, just because they're, they're pretty great. Yeah, but let's dive into your work. So actually you're, uh, how would you describe yourself? You're a documentary filmmaker or where, you, where, you, where did you come from? <laughs> well, I'm obsessed with cinema verite, like, you know, the Albert Maisel's film, Richard Leacock, I mean, the, those films, um, Salesman, the, um, oh, there was a group of people in the 60s in, in, in America who made all these really just slice of life movies. Um, they did a film about Altman and the Rolling Stones. They did the first movie of the Beatles coming to America, but that was like what I was obsessed about. And then I loved, you know, how that influenced Godard and, and the French New Wave. So for me, I, I'm just obsessed with cinema, you know, and neorealism in film. And, and and we see the world that, I mean, the Darden brothers, you know, in Belgium to um, Kelly Reichardt in America. So for me, any way that you take fiction, you take documentary and you blend it together is what excites me. I think that's my sweet spot. I mean, so now I shoot docs, I shoot fiction, I shoot commercials, but I feel as long as it feels like an elevated version of reality, that that's where I think I, I, I find my unique voice in that. You sent me a couple of links to some of the productions you did, some of which are documentaries and some of which are 
feature films and I find it amazing how you both in documentary and feature work you you manage to have a very intimate almost like portrait shots of people very close with the camera it seems very realistic even if it's a feature film what are some of the work that you're most proud of I mean but that's exactly it that like how do you create this false intimacy? Because it is false intimacy, right? You know, like as soon as you put a camera in front of a person and you set up a light and you tell them to stand right here, you have taken reality out of them. And now your job as all the filmmakers, you know, from like the director to the DP, the gaffer, you know, is like, how do we now convince the viewer that this is real? Um, two of my favorite collaborators are, are Michael Jacobs, this director I, I just did um, this Marvel doc with. And then we did a doc last year um, called Black Ball that was on Quibi. And both these are kind of... Um, I mean, they're documentaries and they're interview-based documentaries, but we try to find ways to just not... How do we use the image to tell the story? I know, I know that sounds obvious, <laughs> but often in docs, you know, the director is just like, okay, let's just shoot somebody in a hotel room and then we got that shot. But I don't know, I think that the viewer deserves to really consider like all of that. You know, for, for Marvel, I was really inspired by um, 1980s Tim Burton Batman. You know, even though it's a Marvel movie, like, I just thought there's something really silly about the 80s and Batman and, and that movie. And, and you know, the Marvel Cinema Universe is so serious about itself. And me and Mike were like, no, this is about the original stories. The, I mean, and the original stories in New York City were actually, um, there, there was more of a, a lightness and a funness to them that me and Mike wanted to explore. In Blackballed, it's a project about um, racism in the NBA told from the, from the Clippers. And, um, you know, I was looking at like a more neo-noir um, point of view and how um, you know, it's somewhere between like these people an interrogation that where they're able to tell what happened, but also like it's, it's a dark history of their past. So I wanted to really f feel that feel that um, the pain of what they went through. Um, Milchu Manchevsky, who I, I shot a project for, um, you know, he was Oscar nominated for, for um, Before the Rain, um, and that was like a fiction film that is a. I mean, it's a doc. It's a fiction film that pretends to be a documentary. So obviously he wanted to work with me because of my doc experience, and you know, and we try to do the same. And and often for like the fiction films, I like to do lots of long takes. I try to convince the directors to do. Let's try to do everything in a moving coverage shot because, you know, just like cell phone shots today, you know, you watch something great on TikTok or something great on Instagram, or YouTube. So the camera falls, the camera comes up, the camera goes around someone like, like the whole language of cell phones has actually changed the way I think we can, we can move our cameras as well. Interesting. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you mentioned, um, you know, the, the image should tell a story, of course. I mean, it, it's, I don't think it's that obvious because I mean, it should be obvious, but it, as you said, often isn't obvious because sometimes with documentary shoots, like um, you don't have as much planning and then, you know, like we have that hotel room, as you mentioned, and then we have to do this interview there. But with the examples you showed, like in Black Bolt, but also in the Marvel doc, I think uh, I see that this is a highly kind of stylized background. Um, so you put, how do you work when you get a, a brief on something like this? Is it, uh, are you are you working in a studio? Are you selecting a real location to make it look like you want it to look? So how do you go about that kind of stuff? Uh, because it seems like it's really highly prepared, but I know from a production reality, in documentary, it's very often not that easy. Yeah, and, and again, Michael Jacobs, that, that director, he understands how much preparation matters. And so like we do scout multiple locations to figure out, you know, like, for both Blackballed and for this Marvel doc, we had scout days on docs, which you you, ne you never have scout days on docs, but Mike's projects, he wants to have scout days. It's important to the budget. And so, you know, we find a location and then they try to book as much talent as possible. So, you know, just from a production standpoint, it is difficult money-wise for them because sometimes people cancel, you know, they try to overbook talent. It, it, it's, it's, it's a complicated dance, but at the end of the day though, it's, Either I go or we go together and, you know, and, and I find some shots, I take my, my, my 5D and I go around, you know, and I, I, I prepare a whole bunch of ideas. Yeah, some talent doesn't give us much time and, I, and I've pre-lit it with, um, with, you know, the AC or a PA that sits down or the producer sits down and I can just light something. Obviously, you know, you have to tweak a little bit, you know, for darker skins and lighter skins, like it's all different. And I, I love to get photos of the people I'm filming. <laughs> and I always like, give me, give me height. <laughs> and give me skin complexion and then I can do something for you. But I need those, those two details to start the lighting process. 
Yeah, and then uh, of course, I mean, also skin complexion makes a difference for the background and how you light the background and everything. I mean, uh, contrast is a big thing. I see that um, you are, in terms of framing, I, I, I think your framing is very interesting because you're very daring with your framing, you know, like not, like sometimes, very often not, uh, you know, doing the classical interview framing that kind of puts people in the middle of the, of the shot or are very symmetrical. So, so what's your thought process when you decide on, on framing? Yeah, I think I'm probably most, I, my best skill is I'm an operator. You know, like I think I'm an okay at lighting, but I'm a really great at, 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 at making frames. And, um, and for Marvel, you know, there was a subconscious aspect to it because I did read comics a lot growing up. <laughs> and, and you look at the comic book frames and you know, there's boxes all over a page, but um, someone's head's here, someone's head's here. You know, people's heads are all over the place. And I don't know, subconsciously, I'm, I just wanted to imitate those comic pages. And then Sean, who did the graphics, I think he did such a great job of, of, inter, of interweaving, you know, the the comic frames and, and, and the frames of my interviews. So it all feels like a seamless whole, like it feels organic to each other. And, and again, I just think that film is the best and, and I'm docs, commercials, fiction, like when there's a reason for everything that you're doing, you know, as long as like there, you can think about it beforehand, it goes a long way on, on, on the set. Yeah. There is a feature film that I saw the trailer of that you did on your site as well called Menasha, which uh, looks like a really, really cool, interesting comedy uh, in, a, in a yeah sequestered society in New York City. What, what can you tell me about that film and the process? That I started that film making that in like, I think 2015, I think I started making that film. And it was more than after a decade of being behind the camera, I had... Um, I, 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 do, you, do you shoot a lot of verite as well, or do you mostly just shoot more 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 B-roll? Do you find? No, also some verite sometimes. Yeah, sure. When you're shooting a verite, like you know, scene, you're waiting all day. Like, you could literally shoot all day and not get one moment, an intimate moment of somebody's life. And then often they don't even make it into the film, like the most intimate things that that happen to people. So. Just experiencing that, and, and like I said, how much I love the, you know, those Italian neorealistic classics and the Darden brothers, I wanted to do something myself kind of in Brooklyn that I could do on my days off. And, that, and that's how Menasha came about, where I cast non-actors in Brooklyn who are all Hasidic Jews, you know, who like never wanted to be in a film, who barely had cell phones, who weren't on the internet. And, and I just wanted to show their everyday life. And, um, and, and that's what, what Menasha was. You also directed that film? I, I did, I did as well, yeah. Yeah, it, it looks amazing. I mean, it looks like it's like a glimpse into a world that you always see when you're in New York and you kind of, but it's like really diving into it. And it looks like a really, really intimate, sympathetic portrait uh, of the society. So that, that's what amazed me. It looked like a documentary, again, variety, uh, but it's a feature film. Yeah. So it was an amazing learning experience. And it's the only thing I was able to do because I could do it in my backyard and I could do it for just me and my friends to go out for a few days at a time and, and put it together. Cool. So what is your preferred working style when it comes to cameras? What's your, what's your setup? Do you, first of all, do you like to work in larger teams, but, or it seems to me like you're, you're much more comfortable working in a small team. Uh, you know, do you always have an AC? Do you focus yourself? How does it work? Yeah. Well, now I feel a little bit, um, <laughs> what is it? A little pampered that like, I, um, I always have an AC these days. I mean, again, not that I'm opposed to it. If there's a great project, I, it, for me actually, making a great film is most important. Whatever it means to make that great film, I will do. So I will work with a cheap camera, I'll work without an AC, it's all, that's all okay with me. If I, if I really love the filmmaker and I love the project, like that, that's most important thing. But luckily today, um, I usually have an AC and, um, and usually I have a G&E team of, of two to four people usually on, on projects. Um, and I usually use Lexa Mini or something comparable to that on a shoot for, mo for most projects these days. Um, but, but that's not to say like the Marvel film was shot with the C300 Mark II, Black Bald was shot with the Venice, Bikini Moon was shot with Mini, and um, Menasha was shot with the C300 Mark I. So, you know, like um, I'm camera agnostic really, you know, I, I really, 
whatever the production can afford, I'll make it look great. Cause the thing is every camera looks great. Every camera is amazing these days. And, and I love small, I love small hand. Cause I, I'm, I'm a really good handheld operator. So the smaller the camera, the better. Anyway, but I haven't owned a camera. The last camera I owned was a C300 Mark one and I sold it last year actually. So I'm borrowing my friend C300 Mark one for this interview. Cause I feel like I, I lost the boat after I didn't buy the Lexa mini, which I literally, I mean, I've, I've used it hundreds of days since that thing came out and I feel bad I did not I did not buy one. Um, I, I don't know what to get because the camera changes so quick. Um, yeah, so what's what's next for you after the Marvel talk now? Man, you know, it, things are just slow right right now. I mean, I was really lucky that I got to do a few projects over COVID. Like um, I worked on with this other documentarian, Sandy Tan. Um, she did a film called Shirkers that's on Netflix and we just worked on a new series it's on Netflix. Um, it's a funny, fun, project it's gonna be out this summer um i did a, a something with queen latifah last year um about the march from washington and, and civil rights movement um which was really great and that was insane because it was during like this was we shot this in early september in the middle of covid and we built the set and we had like 10 g and e and five camera ops like in a studio in the middle of covid and i couldn't believe we were shooting that honestly i it was crazy but uh, honestly I, I'm I, I'm not, but it's every day of my life is I'm unemployed for the rest of my life. I'm sure you feel the same way, but right now I am unemployed for the rest of my life right now. All right. Thank you, Joshua. That was really, really interesting. If our audience hasn't seen it yet, please go to Disney Plus and watch the Marvel documentary Behind the Mask. It's, it's, it's really interesting to see what you did with the interviews. And also check, check me on, on Instagram. I'll be posting like some behind the scenes stuff and other, and other cool things. Um, it's just my, my full name, Joshua Z Weinstein on, on that too. All right, we put the link in the description below. Awesome. Thank you again for your time. Yeah, thank and you. And thanks everybody for watching. Stay tuned to Synody for a lot more interviews like this one and gear news videos, of course, and reviews of new cameras and lenses. And thanks for watching, bye.